we're going on to the final international criminal organization then from gangster warlords. Oh, this this will lead us nicely then over into into Mexico. Mm. So you've written about the Knights Templar. Mm. How did they originate? The Knights Templar are a, a, a crazy uh, criminal organization that uh, you know were were, were, tra were trafficking crystal meth in a massive way to the United States. One of one of the interesting things about them is their leader, Nasario Moreno. Uh, talking about religious aspects, he had a, a really big religious fascination, and he uh, you know had a crazy story of growing up in poverty in Mexico, in Michoacan, Mexico. And he wrote a lot of this story down in a, in, a, in a memoir he wrote. He actually wrote his own kind of story, his own vision of it. He was like drinking river water when he was a kid. He was like that poor. He said he, said he thought people were rich if they were drinking Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> and he became fascinated by comics and um, by this, this one comic hero in Mexico called Caliman, who's this kind of weird superhero with kind of my, you know psychic powers. So he wanted to develop psychic powers himself. But he had this, you know, crazy train wreck youth and you know, went up to the United States, started selling drugs, started moving drugs back and forth, you know, shot people, was in prison and so forth, was drinking, taking drugs. And then probably when he's in prison in the United States, Texas, he had this weird evangelical awakening. He converted to evangelical Christianity. Uh, and he followed this weird version of evangelical Christianity. And, you know, he wrote his own Bible. And when he was building his big empire of taking meth to the United States, particularly when the United States banned the, or made it harder for the precursor ingredients to make crystal meth from 2005, the combat methamphetamine act in 2005 like it was a big opening in mexico and he was really you know building up then but when he was creating this cartel he had these weird religious ideas so he did one of the big mass beheadings first of all he chopped off five heads threw them onto it or his his you know cartel did threw them onto a dance floor in a city called Uruapan. and there was a note there saying you know this is holy justice and then you know he had this weird thing. Then he, uh, he people he'd make his followers study his writing and do these courses where they would sit there and study his writing. And then he would come all dressed in white as kind of really crazy, like kind of god complex. And then in 2010, he was allegedly killed in this big shootout with the federal police. So it was all reported on the news, this guy's being killed. And then after they started venerating him as like a god with these big statues of him, crazy statues, Santo Nazario, like the Saint Nazario. And so they had these big statues like venerating the guy. And then the, it turned out he hadn't really been killed. <laughs> He and like you know, I was uh, like uh, reporting, and I was talking to these people saying, "Oh yeah, he's not really dead. This guy's still alive." And and I thought, are they just making this shit up? Is he really still alive? And they're just making this up? But actually, it turned out he was really alive, and he was walking around. So some people say, "Oh, he's he's a ghost. He's come back as a ghost." <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of crazy story, but he had a major cartel. I mean, he, he became. A real power he took on. I mean, they killed loads of federal police. They they became a real power, and he took over all these kind of crazy things. And eventually, he was genuinely killed and beaten to death. I went to his wake as well, just after he'd been killed. His wake was there, and it had, his nickname was the maddest one, El Mas Loco. So I went there, and they had all these people dressed in white, and the kind of army were there watching it. And the guy just said to us, "I you know you got you got to go." You can't hang around here. We kind of tried to look around. And he said, "Look, I'm serious. She's got to get out of here uh, right now." <laughs> so, so eventually, we we left, and they took the the the, the body somewhere into the mountains uh, near to his village uh, and buried him. We think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or he's still alive out there. Yeah, that's like the Book of Mormon. 
yeah, meets yeah. Scientology, yeah. meets the Mexican cartel. Yeah, yeah, that is a crazy- That's a whole new level yeah, of madness. It's a crazy, crazy story. I mean, this guy, and, and the more you dig into it, it just gets madder and madder. The story of Nacerio Moreno. And, then, and uh, he was really brought down by the outer defensa movement, the, the militias, the self-defense militias were the ones which really brought him down, not the Mexican government. And that a lot of that's shown in, the, in their documentary, Cartel Land. Yeah, I watched which, that. Yeah, that, and that shows a lot of the fighting against his cartel. Wow. All right, so this brings us nicely then over to the Mexican cartels. A lot of my followers have watched Narcos. Mm. Um, we've got the Mexican Narcos, the recent one. Yeah. The thing I liked about that, even though it's all a DEA fairy tale mostly, yeah. Um, in the Colombian ones, they didn't show the symbiotic relationship with the police and the politicians, yeah. which has always fascinated me. But it showed more of the corruption in the Me in the Mexican one. And the Mexican narcos, for people who haven't watched it, the main story is about the original cartel. There was one cartel in the beginning, the Guadalajara cartel. And that was run by El Padrino. And it all went bad after there was a huge raid on this multi-billion dollar weed plantation. And also they lost some Coke shipments. And a guy had, had worked his way into the cartel who was actually an undercover agent for the DEA and that was Kiki Camarena. And what happens to him is absolutely horrific. So I'd like to just go over this whole story and ask you from your perspective on mm -hmm. it. Um, and for people, assuming people haven't seen any of this and don't know who any of these characters are, set the table by asking you about the individual characters first. Hmm. So who is El Padrino, the godfather? Who, who, he's still alive, yeah? Yeah, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Yeah. So, I mean, you got, you got the, the, so the, the weird thing about this, this story, I guess, is that, you know, particularly with the story of the Mexican drug cartels, you know, you have this weird interaction between kind of fiction and reality. Being that some of the real, you know, you have these stories that are told in like Narcos TV series and other um, Latin American um, narco novelas that are there. And people see those and that kind of becomes the story. Then the real people in real life sometimes copy and echo what's in the fiction then the fiction's copying and the, and, it, and often the reality is so weird anyway. There's sometimes, you know, they kind of with weird differentiation. So kind of narcos, you know, we're talking about it now using that as a base, you know, a kind of dramatized version as a base of reality. So that kind of adds to the myths or whatever. <laughs> so you get that. But I would say to, to take the Mexican drug trafficking, go back a little bit, uh, all the way, well, I trace this in, in my book, El Narco, all the way back to the early 20th century when you you know the united states first started restricting opium and cocaine within the harrison's narcotics tax act and they started making it more difficult to get opium legally in the united states so you had a population then of chinese mexicans particularly around sinaloa area in mexico they'd come to build railways and work in mines and were growing opium, and they started bringing opium from there over to Chinese Americans, and that was the beginning of the Mexican to U.S. drug trade. And did they learn about the opium from the British, yeah, forcing well, it on yeah, the Chinese. Yeah, exactly. Queen right. Victoria was the biggest drug kingpin in the world yeah, at that yeah, point, exactly, wasn't she? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> funny irony there. Yeah. Obviously, it was us uh, and the Opium Wars who who, who forced the uh, them to keep you know buying uh, Indian opium taken to China, but they they then brought it to Mexico, and that was the beginning of this of this trade. Now the Mexican uh, criminals, bandits expropriated this from the from the Chinese, took it off their hands because they started seeing money was being made there, so started taking over this business. And there was actually a lot of violence against Chinese Mexicans going back to the 19th. 20s, 1930s. And in this wave, they took over this, this, this drug trade. And you had this, this growing up. The big early days, it was quite a small business. You know, it was a bit like we might think about contraband cigarettes or something. It's like little side things that people are making a bit of money. But gradually it got bigger and bigger when you started having Americans 
taking way more drugs from the 1960s onwards. So like a sudden explosion of Americans smoking loads of marijuana, they go to the border, you know, and where do we get it? Let's go to Mexico to get it. Go to the border, buy it in Mexico. Then you have the cocaine, then the moving of the cocaine from the Colombia to Florida route to Mexico. And this is where, start, where you start to get El Padrino coming in. Now, really, a character, what's not really shown in the Narcos series is that that link was made, well, there was a couple of things before, but one of the person who, when you talk to people involved in the business, who they really credit making that was the Colombian Rodriguez Gacha, Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha, known in Colombia as El Mexicano, the Mexican, you know, he's a Colombian, because he made his things probably in the late 70s went there and started making this deal with the Mexicans to take cocaine to the United States. So the way this is, is like from Colombia, you can fly to Florida and it's like a 900 mile flight right across to Miami, to Florida. Now the US started to crack down this route from the early 1980s. So the Colombians look more to this Mexican link where you have a 2000 mile land border and you can take drugs into the United States. And at the beginning, it was often paying them in cocaine. So the idea, you know, you could say like for the Colombians, it cost $2,000 kilo, $2, for a kilo of cocaine. But they can sell it in the US border at $30,000 for a kilo. So you can pay a percentage of the Mexicans to take the product to the United States. So you had the figure of uh, El Mexicano, uh, Rodriguez Gacha, and then the figure comes in of Miguel Fili Angel Felix Gallardo emerging out of Sinaloa. So Sinaloa is the place in Mexico which is the cradle of drug trafficking, a bit like Sicily is to the Italian mafia. And out of there, you get these Sinaloan kingpins arising. Now, Felix Gallardo uh, was at some point a, he started it a business. He did some, I mean, quite an, uh, uh, like kind of business high school. Did some studies there. And then so he had obviously a business mind, an economics mind. And he uh, was a police officer for a little while. And one was a bodyguard, as a police officer, assigned as a bodyguard to some political family. And then emerged in the drug trade when the Mexican military hit really hard the business in Sinaloa and the people moved to Guadalajara, kind of moved from Sinaloa where a lot of heat was on to the city of Guadalajara and they set up these operations. And he, I mean, there's, there's debate really about whether he was a clear leader or it was more of a collection of these various drug traffickers. Him, uh, there was this guy, Caro Quintero, and this guy, Ernesto Fonseca with this kind of trio of people who, who, who created this, you know, first cartel in Mexico.